Pac-Man Mitchell. All right, guys. Energy, right? Yeah, taxes. <laughs> Promise won't bully you to sleep, but uh, we do need to get into the details a little bit, so bear with me there, right? Which is why we're here, though, right? That's good. That's good. So, real estate tax advice and insights. I am Mitch Hagen. I should have put Mitch. I don't know why I put Mitchell. Real name is Mitchell, but please call me Mitch. Jumping in. Here's our agenda. Now, the goal is learn a little bit about taxes, but the real go is some takeaways, I think Ted calls them golden nuggets, and right on. And then ask me later, because as we all know, everyone here is different, all our tax circumstances are different. I won't be able to give you actual tax advice in front of 100 people and it actually be applicable. So biggest thing to keep in mind, I'm gonna throw quite a few high level topics out that can get technical quick. Ask your questions, I'll do my best to answer it on the fly, but the real value here will be the follow-up. So here's our agenda. Who is Mitch Hagen? Who is Frankel Zachariah? What is Frankel Zachariah? It's a mouthful. Disclaimer on the info, number one tax answer. Just, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Flipping homes, rentals, real estate professionals, what that really means from a tax standpoint, because that is very important, as we'll get to. Uh, net operating losses, which is a huge part of rentals and depreciation. The, the, uh, 1031 exchanges, that's kind of the hot, sexy thing, but super complicated. We'll, we'll, we'll high level on that one. We'll lead it home with retirement accounts and, and how to potentially invest real estate. And then the big change is Nebraska 45L. So, who is Mitch Hagen? First of all, I am husband of Emily Hagen, M's Woodwork. Represent and Benito, my first son. Yeah, I'm super excited too. Yeah. He's a hard sleeper, you can clap. He's a hard sleeper. Uh, he was born in August, so I'm kind of figuring out the whole bad thing, but super excited. Today was my first, well, one of my first full days with him, so I'm a little, little tired. <laughs> but we're good. Uh, Emily and I got married uh, June of 2018, and I, I say this because it relates to real estate. Um, before that, I was kind of do on the fly, yes man, I want to learn everything, do everything, you bring it in, I'll do it. Uh, but June of 2018, we got married, we bought our first house, and it was a serious fixer-upper, if anyone knows that term, right? Um, we saw the value, we we're going to put the sweat equity in, we we're going to make it work and then flip it or rent it or whatever. Um, we ended up having a house fire two weeks later. Uh, and we didn't lose the house, but the previous owner had painted the original hardwood floor black. It was disgusting. It, there was cat pee all over it. I mean, she's nodding her head over there. It was, yeah. It's like we spent a week probably sanding that floor, and yeah, it was sad. But we, we did the first coat of stain, first time stainers. Gotta learn where you put that rag after you do the first coat, you know? We put it in our, yeah, here we go. We put it in our trash, which was a cardboard box full of shit. Uh, and we got, let's see, we finished that first coat probably at 11, and she got there um, probably at 2 the next day, and she calls me, like, hey, I think we had a house fire. What the hell are you talking about? I'm, gonna, I'm out at an audit at a client doing some work, and I get this phone call, and oh, she knows how to work. Answer, yeah, I think we had, a, we had a house fire. Who thinks they have a house fire? Is the house still there? She's like, yeah, the house is still there. But... Uh, it's kind of hard to breathe in here and just get over here. So I left work and sure shit, we had a pile of ash. Our, our blinds were melted. Our, all our nails were popped. Um, the, the fire was like, <laughs> our, our fire was so hot that the bulbs over the flame warped. They didn't pop. The fire chief, I think, said it was the first time he'd ever seen it. He'd seen like 100 plus fires. Um, long story short, the, our little you know, DIY project became like an like a, a endeavor. So we spent our first seven months of marriage dealing with that, um, and we learned a ton. We did a lot of it ourselves, and from there, my wife started her, her business, Ends Woodwork, where she does, we kind of fill in the blank, but conference tables, charcuterie boards, end tables. Um, and then around the same time is also when Andy Worthington, a partner at the firm, kind of recruited me to start working with Jerry and Ted and Chris Parmalou and Colin Schwartz in the real estate 
So I've got the, the personal side of the real estate game meets the professional side of the real estate game. So I, long story short, 2018 was a big year in a lot of ways, and that's part of the reason why I'm here. So I'm, I'm super thankful for it. My wife, super thankful for it. And we stayed married. Yeah, way to now. Yeah, like three and a half years or something. Yeah, right on. Uh, we made it. We made it. And then, oh God, I forgot to say, we bought we bought three dogs. Yeah, don't recommend that with a newborn, but it's going okay. It's going. Okay. Oh, what kind of dogs I was asked? So my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, bought her first dog. She's now five and a half. Border Collie Beagle mix. Super loud bark, but Benito sleeps through it. Thank God. Uh, great. Yeah, great personality there for now. Uh, then we got uh, kind of a, another mix from Kansas, like a shepherd, lab-ish mix. Way too much energy for our little house, but we, we love him, and he's a sweetheart. And then we got a Cocker Spaniel. Um, so 55, 55, 30, and it was supposed to be 30, 30, 20 for weight. So you could say, oh yeah, we get this dog, it'll be 30 pounds, oh, 55. Oh, okay, we, we got him, he's like 15 weeks old, he'll be like 30 pounds, he's 55 pounds. Cocker Spaniel, those are small, 30 pounds. Oh, shit. <laughs> so news to say, no, no dull moments, and I'm super thankful for it. Oh yeah, what do I do? So me, I'm a CPA, real estate tax is my, my favorite, my niche, um, a lot to it, so that's really what I focus in on, but I also do construction, and kind of fill in the blank. We, we serve anywhere from individuals, um, fresh out of college, all the way through, I think one of our biggest clients is like $750 million in revenue. So we spread the gambit, we're a local office, we have all 50 states plus international work. Um, myself, specifically, Midwest, Florida, New York, New Jersey, California is my, um, my areas to date. If anyone's got something different, come meet me, let's add to that state list, please. Let's do it. Um, Franklin Zachariah, it is a mouthful, I'm well aware. But we are on 114th and Dodge for the seventh floor of that building, the First National Bank building. IT services, business valuations, if another business is looking to buy another business, M&A work, and then oh yeah, we do tax stuff too. Jumping ahead, tax info today. So here's kind of my CYA, right? Gotta have one. Not providing tax advice. How do you get tax advice? Well, because you're a member, free hour of consultation. So follow up, please. My wife's got some business cards. If I run out, which I undoubtedly will, please write your name and I'll follow up with you. Yeah, you're nice. She took one of my only business cards. Uh, I'll follow up with you. If not, my information will be up here. Please reach out. I am a CPA. I do have personality, though, so don't be afraid to call me. I would love to see you in person, talk over the phone, whatever. What to bring is important. It, the, the, the best way to get value out of that meeting will be prior your tax returns. If it's at this point of the year, you'll probably want to have an idea of what 2021 looks like. Don't bring a shoebox with your seats. But don't want it. It won't help anybody. Stick to this list. And then short-term and long-term goals. I think that's understated. Uh, a lot of what I do is, is uh, oftentimes somebody will come to me in January like, hey, Here's, here's what I did. Oh, well, we can't do anything about that. Now we just got to report it. But let's think ahead. Now is a great time to meet with me because I can figure out what you really want if we can do something before the end of December and then um, plus your experience. So taxes, yes, the tax return is super exciting and stuff. It's important. But the engagement with me, I think, will help bring value to the service itself. Again, uh, you think probably a tax CPA, you think, oh, this guy is like, oh, I'll give him my shoebox, we'll get this shit done, and I'll, I'll talk to him next April or something. No, please don't. I won't better for that. My wife will think I'm cranky, probably. I, I like the engagement. I, I do have energy, but I do like the tax stuff itself. So, prior tax returns, career, summary, short term, long term goals. So, I said earlier, what will my answer probably be? It depends. Because I know, I might not know much, if anything, about you when you ask me a question. Please still ask the question because, again, the goal of today is to get the gears turning, think of additional questions to ask, how does this apply to me, what do I need to do, etc. So, ask the question. That might be my answer, but then I'll, I'll try and give you something on the fly as well, um, without knowing your background. It depends. 
Okay, throw a lot of sometimes garbage at you. What do you guys think? Any questions so far? Otherwise, I'm going to jump right in. Mike, what do you think? It's good. You guys do course analysis, Going to get to that. Thank you for bringing that up. He asked about cost segs. Do we do that? Yes, we have a partner firm we work with. That's very important for depreciation. I'll bring that up again later, but that was his question. Anyone else got something? All right, we're jumping right in. Real estate dealer and flipping. Now, those two are actually two different things. Um, they might, some people might not have heard of a real estate dealer. It's, it's somebody that buys a house and then sells it as is, essentially. They might make some adjustments, but you're essentially, your inventory, your cost of goods sold is the house itself. You buy it, you sell it to another person who's gonna either flip it, rent it, live in it, etc. Flipping, as, the, as you see in HGTV and a lot of what we do, you buy it, you rehab it, then you sell it, or you maybe you keep it long term, etc. Ordinary active income. Here's another uh, jargon thrown at you. Think of a W-2 wage. The W-2 has its high tax brackets. You go from 0, 15, 12, whatever, up to 30, 37. They think they're changing it to 39, maybe, hopefully not. Mm -hmm. But it's high tax brackets, high, high tax rates, and plus you also have what's called self-employment taxes, 15.3%. What is that? It's uh, two halves, it's employee and employer side of Medicare and Social Security. Now you don't need to remember that. Just know that if you're flipping homes, know that you have higher tax rates when you have income. Also know that there's ways to um, there's a game to be played, I'll call it that, using S corporations. I think I was talking to somebody about that. <coughs> uh, long story short, S corporations, you are an employee of your own business. You pay yourself a wage, and that's some way of saving on self employment tax. Now, that can get really technical. I've already said a lot of jargon. I'm going to leave it at that for now. One of the, ban the benefit, uh, benefits of having ordinary or active income is. Uh, better deductions. So, in an active business, your 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 expenses won't be limited the same way as if you were a passive investor in rental real estate. So, what the hell does that mean? Um, think about it this way: if if you were a passive investor in a group of partners owning a property, one you just you know you just getting a paycheck or a stream of income, right? But if you spent money on that investment that might not get a deduction for you that year. It's called a suspended loss for passive investors or passive activity losses. I'm gonna hammer that home more later, but just know that active income, active expenses, better deductions in the current year, generally. What else we got? Criteria and documentation. So how do you prove that you're an active flipper or active in your business um, while you're doing it, right? Or you probably have calendar invites, you got a ton of emails talking about your business. Um, the, the main thing to keep in mind here is for those who are a secondary partner, who aren't active, who are maybe the, the, uh, the funding of their operation. They will have to keep this in mind. But for those of you who are flipping, some of you are not in the heads, yeah, I do that, yep. I've got my shoebox at home. I don't want to see that again. Give me the summary. Something to keep in mind. Um, mileage is another thing, too. If you got a calendar, you have your calendar events, you've got an app that says, hey, every time you get in the car, I'm going to X, Y, and Z property, I'm going to meet my X, Y, and Z buyers. Um, you got to launch with them, track that on your calendar. It's a good way to support it. Uh, this is a kind of a selfish note for me, for accounting purposes. Anyone who does their books, I threw this out for you to save me time, maybe later. Um, how do you account for refis? So the hot thing right now is cash out refis, right? You buy a property, you rehab it, you do a, uh, well, cash, you refinance it, you take the cash out, and you go buy another one. How do you account for that? Here's, I promise this is about as technical for accounting as I'll get from the day-to-day -day perspective. Um, your loan increases, your cash account should increase, the refi costs are what's amortized or depreciated. I'm not going to hammer that home, but for those of you who get that, 
Let's do it. Let's do it together. All right. Continuing on. Oh, and by the way, if you have questions, raise your hand. We'll we'll get to it. Otherwise, I'll get to them at the end. Oh, what's up? Uh, just like active. Say you like a group of four or five people on the property or something, and uh, would it just would you define active just being the one or two people that are actually active? Good property question. On yeah. Kind of yes, yeah, so you're talking about rental. Then right, rental. Yeah, so I'll hammer that home, but real quick, he's asking how how are you defining active versus passive for rentals? And for the most part, you need to be involved in the decision making, you need to be involved in the property management, high level, maybe looking at the financials, deciding which banks you finance with or refinance with. Um, if you're part of the tenants, filter in, you know, um, that'd be good. And then also the prospecting of the operation. Those are good high level items. So jumping in the rentals. Oh, yep. But I don't know what the question was. That still doesn't make it active income tax that active income. It's still a passive investment. Correct. Yep. And yes, I'm glad you know. specified that. Yeah. Um, I'll answer that in a second. Too. I was wondering one year about the real estate professional status. Some of them going through stamps, but they wanted documentation with 180 hours uh, documented. 180? Yeah, 180 hours. I have 800, but I had to spend a week on documenting, like writing, paying with checks, going to see properties. That's fun, isn't it? Going to stay, but I haven't, I have produced a 20 foot document, but I don't want to touch on that. I will. It's going to be about six slides from now. But he, he's asking about real estate professional status. I'm going to answer that in, in, when I get to that, but it is important. and. If there's, if there's one or two things you keep away, I would keep that in mind. Because um, that'll make or break some of your major benefits of being in a rental real estate in particular. Um, and then here's I want to get to too as well. Thanks, Brad. All right, condos, single family homes, multifamily, commercial, I mean, you could list out more. Rentals. Um, anywhere from Airbnb to long-term, year-over-year stays. Now, within that category, Airbnb or like the day-to-day, the -day almost hotel-style rentals, that has a different tax or income tax ramification than there would be for like a month stay or beyond. I think somebody was talking to me about that earlier. But I'm gonna talk about the long-term here because that's gonna be more applicable for the most part. Long-term rentals as a, as a whole are passive income. Passive income avoids some of the higher ordinary income tax brackets. Again, I, I can try and keep this less, or not super technical, I'm seeing some glazed eyes here, stay with me. But the, the benefits are when you sell the property later, capital gains tax. Now I know some people have heard capital gains before. That's a much better circumstance than ordinary income tax. So sticking to that, um, there are different types of tax categories within this and passive rentals. I'm gonna leave it at that. It gets very technical again quickly, but um, ownership is important here. Ownership could be if, if I owned a pro property directly by myself, that's one way. If I brought in a partner, an LLC partnership, that's another way. We might have different tax treatments. Well, what are you talking about? We're in a partnership, we own one property. Why aren't we taxed the same? Well, it depends on your personal tax facts. So if my partner, if, uh, well, bad example. If a friend and I go in on a partnership, we're not related, we're, we're not spouses or we're partners in that sense, we're just business partners. We have our own personal tax returns, but we go in on a partnership. I bring the funding. I'm, I'm, I know from a fact I don't want anything to do with it other than get the paycheck and provide some cash. I'm passive. The other person, maybe it's Brad. Brad is making all the decisions. He's finding all the renters. He's, he's leading the rehab. Um, he's figuring out the cash refi process. He's documenting all the, all the details. Brad would be active. Brad would get the best benefits. Now there's other layers, one of which is, is he a real estate professional? We're gonna hammer that home again later, but just know that that's one of the phases 
of deciding between whether you're going to get your biggest bang for your buck on your deductions and your income and offsetting, et cetera. Uh, ownership, ownership part. Oh, so S Corps were big for flipping. Active income, you have self employment taxes, you had not self employment taxes, you want to save on self employment tax. S corporation, you pay yourself a wage. For rentals, for passive income, you do not have, for the most part, it depends, self employment taxes. Yeah, there's some maps, thanks guys. Uh, self employment tax, so you, you don't you don't need S Corp, nor do you want it generally, because if you put property in an S corporation and later you want to take it out for whatever reason, maybe you want to upgrade to a bigger property, it's a taxable event. So let me back up to it again. If you have an S corporation and you have property in an S corporation, that's its own thing, its own taxable entity. If your S corporation owns something, a uh, single family home, and you want to go to a duplex, if you take that property out, you have to pay your business. There's a taxable event. If it's in an LLC partnership, not an S corporation, no taxable event. So the only thing to remember there is flipping S corp, rental, LLC. That's it, it's uh, nuts, let's keep it simple. So, depreciation, here we go. All right, so for rentals, it is critical to hone in on your depreciation because that will greatly change your RO, or rate of return, greatly change. Um, depreciation, oh, and actually let me say this, so rentals are depreciation, rentals are LLCs. Flipping, S-Corp, flipping, you do not get depreciation. Flipping, your intention is to sell the property, consider it inventory. Rental is a, is a, is a property plant equipment. It's, a, it's used in your business so you will then get depreciation. So flipping, S-Corp, no depreciation. Rental, LLC, no S-Corp, depreciation. Just a point of clarification. You, you're talking about LLCs and S-Corps as separate things. I think I think the uh, a lot of folks in this room are probably familiar with LLCs with an S-Corp election. Right. So you treat it as an S-Corp. That's not a true S-Corp. If you would d just differentiate those. Good question. Well. Thank you for asking that. So he asked, um, I'm, I'm talking as if an LLC and an S-Corp are separate things. They're not always separate. You might have an S-Corp and treat it for tax purposes as an S-Corp. There's a head nod. Yeah, so the, the key is for tax purposes, thank you, S-Corp. So an LLC can be an S-Corp, but I'm just talking as an S-Corp that hopefully avoid confusion. For LLC, treat it separately, S-Corp for tax purposes, flipping. Thank you for asking that. Somebody else had a question too. Oh, yep. So I'm a member and... Um, thank you. Yeah, so I'm a lender with Charter West Mortgage, and when I have people come to me and they have rental properties, number one, they are allowed to have up to 10 financed through Fannie or Freddie, Freddie Mac, um, but they have to be in their individual name, they can't be in an LLC. So I always tell them, let's start out as an individual, once it's financed, you can then switch it into an LLC. Is there any tax? issues that they need to look out for so, on that. Without the, giving me tax <laughs> I'm assuming everyone heard her because of the mic. Yeah. Okay, there's that. Thank you. So, for the LLC, do they own it 100% or yeah. is somebody... So, then I tell them you can put it into like a single member. Got office. it. Got it. Okay. So, she was saying, get a financed person. So, I buy a home. I get it financed through a, a lender and then contribute it into a, an LLC that I own. For tax purposes, no issue. No escort, no issue, right? Let's keep that in mind. No escort, we're talking about properties long-term, no issue. So thank you for asking that. I had not known that 10 threshold. Interesting. you do get better interest rates that way. So through my own name, I get a better interest rate and then I contribute to a single member LLC. Yep. That's Oh, they're smart. That's cool. I have cards later. Yeah, well, this table. This is the table. Remember, wife, Benito, bang right there, lender. All right. 
Um, is that Mike? Yes. I've heard that a two person, some legal advice over various. Oh, here you go, Mike. One second. Yeah. A two person LLC, which is a LLC partnership, is a lot better in terms of not being able to pierce that versus a single, single person LLC. That's a good question. I filed separate tax returns. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's, it's more of an independent entity and it's a lot harder to pierce. Well, not an attorney. You're trying to trick me here. I see what you're doing. <laughs> but I'm going to answer it the best I can. Knowing I'm not an attorney, people, no legal advice and no tax advice. But he's asking is, this, is, a, is a partnership LLC? Two people make an LLC partnership filing a partnership income tax return. Is that better protection than if I owned it myself? It oh, damn right it depends. <laughs> yeah, big time. And here's the main thing. If, if I work with somebody for a business purpose in a partnership, by nature, you are gonna be more respectful of the, the, the bank account, the loan, the property, so you're gonna treat it separately than if my wife and I did something or if I just did something myself. Like, yeah, I've got my business credit card, I go on vacation like three times a year with it. Well, that's clearly not a business expense if your property's in Omaha and you're going to New York, right? For a non, yeah, it is, no. Uh, so point, the main thing to hone in there is that you should try and keep a, a business veil, a corporate veil is what they call it. Uh, the fact that it's a single member LLC versus a partnership LLC, non attorney, they might have something different, but I would focus on keeping your, your shit separate. Like have a, have a single member LLC business bank account, credit card, and then you have your own personal stuff. That's the cleanest way and a great defense for if you're ever audited. Thanks for asking that. And whether you're living to do it as an individual. Always have a separate account for your record. She's going to have a separate account if you have a. Uh, thanks. Sorry, Ted. And hey, we're recording this for a podcast, so if you guys have questions, just raise your hands. We'll come over to you and give you the microphone, too. So thank you. Thanks, Ted. So she was saying that if, if you buy it yourself and then put it into a, an LLC you 100% own, you should also set up a separate account, whether that be credit card or bank account or, or maybe a loan, I suppose, in an LLC name, right? Well, so what I found is that newer people that are getting into rentals and flipping, and they'll start out in their individual names, but they run everything through their personal checking account. Do not do that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, separate. I mean yeah. it's easier to put those P&Ls and those balance sheets together right. for your bankers, whether you're getting an individual loan in your personal name right. or an LLC on the business side, if you are keeping it truly separate. And it's a lot easier for Definitely. the tax people as well, as well as um, IRS audits. I mean, they want to see it separated. Yeah, and actually, I think it was on Ted's podcast that you or Owen or somebody said that they took photos when they purchased something. So if, if they were about to buy a rehab, X, Y, and Z, a tool or something for a specific property, they take a photo of that receipt and then put it in an album for X, Y, and Z property. So that when they go back, whether it's that day or that week or whenever it is, oh, well, that's what it was. Old owns golden nugget. So the point <laughs> is that in the moment, like, oh, I'm definitely gonna remember this. I've got 15 properties. I'm very organized mentally. I can keep this track. Well, hey, Mish, uh, shit, I can't remember. I need your help. And here's my bank logs. I have everything in my personal account. Just know that like roughly these dates each month are these properties and then the other ones are these. I don't want that. And I'll try my best to help you, but oh, it's, you know, it's April 1st, they're due in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna accept this. <laughs> yeah, there's a head nod too. Like, there's a 80 weeks for you right there, eight hour weeks. I try my best. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I try my best. My son doesn't know it yet, but I'm sure he'll be bummed those early weeks of April. Uh, and my birthday actually clarifies April 12th, so... Aww. Oh, my brother! You get the same birthday, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great day. Tax day is my day. Our day. Yeah. Uh, anyways, we do our best, but... Uh, what's a phrase? Garbage in, garbage out? Yeah, there's some headnots too, right now. Okay, so I think... Oh, I haven't even got the customs yet. Right, so that's a big thing. So the appreciation... 
Rentals, you get depreciation. Rentals are LLCs, not S-Corps. Depreciation is basically your, your purchase price of your property, and you're, you're getting that as a deduction over X amount of years. Depreciable, what is, what is depreciation? What is allowed? Let's say you buy a property for, let's keep it easy, $100,000 you gotta figure out what is for depreciation, what's non-depreciable. Land is not depreciable. Land is not depreciable. So you take 100,000, if your land was 10,000, we've got 90,000 to depreciate. All right, now what are we gonna use? How are we gonna get to zero? And what time frame are we gonna do that under? Depends on the useful life. So a very risk uh, conservative approach without a cost seg would be that 90,000 for a single family home would be 27 and a half years of um, depreciation. You get that over 27 and a half years. Now that, if anyone's doing some mental math, that's not a lot of depreciation every year. And you've heard on YouTube, Ted's, uh, Ted's podcasts or on Google that there's ways to get more bang for your buck earlier, right? How do you do that? Well, cost segs is the best detailed um, research supported way to do that, but that value, your your rate of return is better on like a 750 or a million dollar property plus. Now there are, I met somebody a couple months ago, but I think he was moving to Kansas that said he could do under 750. If you're here, please raise your hand. If not, um, our partner that we work with, they're at the 750 a million dollar range where you're paying a couple thousand dollars to get a super detailed report with photos and research and support. These categories are five year, 10 year, or I'm sorry, five year, 15 year, 27. There are more categories than that, but we're gonna stick with that. Throw a lot at you. So again, depreciation, your, your depreciation, your original purchase price, in this case, $100,000 over a certain time frame. You have to figure out what's depreciable and what is not. Not is land in this example, $10,000. $90,000 is what we're working with. We're trying to get from 27 and a half to something much less. So what are examples? Cabinets, granite countertops, flooring, um, those are examples of five year. Landscaping, parking lots, driveways, those are examples of 15 year. Why does the year matter? The year matters because, well, that's a time frame you depreciated, but also currently there's what's called bonus depreciation at 100%. Bonus depreciation at 100%. I believe that's for another two years. Bonus depreciation for 15 year live assets and lower you get 100% of the cost as an expense in the first year. So instead of going from 90,000 over 27 and a half years, you break out, let's call it $20,000 into 15 and five year assets, you get $20,000 today. Not over 15 year and five year. They are 15 year and five year assets. Again, parking lot, cabinetry, <clears throat> this goes on. But you get that bonus expense all in the first year. 100% bonus, that's what that's called. So now we've got 100,000, take out land of 10, you got 90. Now we're going from 90 to 20 for current year, and then you get the 70 as 27 and a half. I mean, I'm just keeping up with the math. It's about the extent of the mental math I can do, so. Everything. Um, it's a big deal. So then, if you project out thirty properties or a million dollar project, well, that's a that's a big deal, very big deal. You're talking change your your rate of return in the first year, make or break maybe the your cash flow needs and maybe your cash out refi, whatever. We're, we'll get ahead of ourselves here. Point being, it's important. The best way to do that is a cost seg. Otherwise, you're doing some personal estimates. Maybe you work with me and say, hey, Mitch, I've got pictures of this and this and this. Um, let's, let's figure out an estimate together. Um, otherwise, we'll reference a county assessor and look at what they say the land is. That's a good study for our land. Um, key thing is, depreciation is a big deal. 
it's a it's an estimate for the most part unless you have a report that says this is this, this is that. You can have oh hold on one second. Here's a mic. So does the tax account typically help the tax client do that analysis or does the client basically provide that information to you, the tax accountant? That breakout of it's a great question. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's a discussion preferably with so if we're working together, we'll have a discussion over it. At the end of the day, it's it's on the tax preparer, right? That's the return. That's their their return. So know that that's it, it's ultimately on you. But I'm providing advice. I do have some advice risk, we'll call it. But at the end of the day, it starts with you, it ends with you. But it's best to keep me involved, and we can and we can discuss it. Um, I hope that answers your question. It basically it depends. Yeah. On those cost savings, as far as the components of the property, that's all. So, say it's a six-year-old water heater in a property I just bought. Yeah. I can still, I still get the full depreciation on that water heater, even though it's six years old. Or is there some kind of loss? Or that's a great question. Yeah. So, if you're buying a property, that's the new price of the property. So, you're taking that new price of the property, and everything. If it's 50 years old or brand new, you're reassigning the value. So, let's use a million-dollar example. Cost site. A cost site will literally go through everything in that freaking house. Water heater, cabinets, uh, electrical work, countertops, bathroom. Like they'll, they'll go to everything in your house and say, this is the value. Maybe a week ago when they replaced it, they bought that toilet for like 200 bucks. Now because you bought it, the whole property at a million, that toilet's worth $400. That's just the way it is, right? You're, you're saying, I'm buying everything in this property for a million dollars. That cost seg, our cost seg team will go in and say, this is the, the now value of that toilet. And you get that appreciation or that current year deduction because of it. Great question. Thank you for asking me. Oh, here. Right behind you. Quick, quick, quick clarification. I think when you were talking about just having a one on one conversation with clients and coming up with an estimate, you were just talking about splitting out the land, normal depreciation. You were not talking about just the two of you coming up with a cost seg study and breaking out cabinets and stuff. You you need a study. Great question. That, correct. If you're if you want to be certain of your depreciation, cost seg. I am I cannot guarantee anything. It's a discussion where I provide parameters of maybe some rule of thumbs, industry rule of thumbs on beyond the land other category, the deeper conversation. So you're asking, how do you get to that deeper conversation? I can, I can be a part of that, but I'm not giving any uh, guarantee on that five year, 15 year. I, I might have some parameters or some estimates that, that the firm has used before, but if you're asking about certainty on those lower parameters, that's a cost say. Did that answer your question? No. Okay, so <laughs> I made it more complicated. Okay, so I think what you're, I think what you're asking. Would you actually let your clients say if they have good documentation, break out a parking lot or something? Oh like yeah. Study? Yes. So if, if you come to me saying this is what I, this is what I know our parking lot's worth this, a neighboring parking lot was just this changed. I don't have one for my lots, but I know what they did, and I have proof of theirs. So Mitch, here's what my lots worth, my parking lot. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and I, I thank you for sticking with me on that. So, yeah. well, one, two questions. Uh, you have to have active losses to use depreciation against, correct? If you don't have enough active income, or sorry, active income, you want to use your depreciation up to a certain point, yeah. so that such that it offsets your active income. But if you have a bunch of rental properties that have no active income, then you know what do you do with that? You just accrue passive losses. So it becomes, it becomes a net operating loss, which. I haven't got to yet. It becomes a net operating loss and it just continues forward until you have that income. Okay. Now, there are some tax law changes that might limit that or put a stop on that. I'm not going to dive into that, but it continues to go forward until you can use it. Or if it's a passive loss, use against passive income. So, what's another passive income? Maybe of stocks. And you had a huge gain on a, a stock sale. Your loss might offset that passive income. If you're married, can your spouse that's passive help your your spouse that's active? In other words, you're if passive you're, and active. Yeah, if you're bringing in a loss and your spouse, your new spouse has income, yeah, that can be offset in the current year as long as you file a joint return. And then last free question: alternative minimum tax. Oh, 
doesn't have to. So you can zero yourself out, pay z legally pay zero income tax, I, zero out all your active, I, and then you don't turn to the AMT? I, well, it depends, yeah. I try to be smart then, I realize it's a really complicated issue. So, uh, uh, alter, uh, al alter alternative minimum tax, uh, I said it doesn't matter because under the Trump tax law and some of the stimulus changes, it was basically wiped out. It might matter again here shortly. Um, I'm not going to dive into that. It's, it's, for the most part, not worth your time right now. That's a very niche and heavy, so I'm getting out of that question, Mr. Adam. <laughs> but for the most part, really, it, we're the, let's say 95% of this group doesn't want to hear about that right now. So that I am sure you can guarantee you, you don't want to hear about that right now. <laughs> Brad, what's up? Yeah, uh, I'm sure most people have probably heard the word cost segregation yeah. and stuff, but uh, is there like a general rule or industry practice you don't want to do it like for the cost of doing an actual cost segregation? Is it worth doing it on a single family, a fourplex, oh, a tenplex, sure. a twenty-fourplex? I know the larger yeah. you get, it really makes a big difference. Yeah. So I don't know if there's what's the threshold like, there. Yeah, like just in your, you know, yeah, in, in that's a great question. But it, wait, yeah. So. It does, because what you could do is you, you might buy 24 properties, single family homes, for, I don't know, two or three million dollars or whatever, and then it might be worth doing a cost set. It, it, the largest driver is the benefit gain for the price you pay. Now, that sounds really dumb, right, because it's obvious, but if you're going to pay like a, I don't know, three to fifteen thousand dollar cost set report, there's got to be the current year benefit, right? And for the most part, it's not the type of property, it's the dollar value. So I appreciate you asking that question. Again, he's asking, is it a type of property, single family home or apartment complex or, or, or something that makes it beneficial? Another rule of thumb to know I should do this? No, it's really the purchase price that drives the factor. Now, they often go hand in hand because a million dollar property, more likely than not, won't be a single family home, right? But if you're buying 15 properties, that's a discussion. So if you if you think you're coming in in this circumstance and you're ahead of the game, reach out. And it's a conversation. Oh, oh one more mic there. So if you do the cost tag and you break out several of these things, get all the depreciation up front, but then you don't hold the property for 27 and a half years, and you sell it after five, yeah. are they coming back and doing a recapture and making you pay some of that back? There is, a, there is a calculation. I wouldn't let that stop you because you will definitely get the benefits. So time value of money, anybody? Yeah. You definitely get the value right there. The gain, um, let's say you're 15 years into a 27 year property, there might be a little bit, it, it won't, it, there might be a little bit to answer your question, yes. But it won't, hold, it won't hold back or make or break the deal in day one or day 15 or years 15. So good question. Via my research, I looked at the statute with the IRS, and it has to be a qualified engineer making a site visit. So as I interviewed these core segregation firms, some said we do it remotely, by drone or by records. No, I, I require a qualified, in, it's in the statute, a qualified engineer to do a physical site inspection. I want to be present also, because I'm an engineer too. Think about it this way. He's saying the cost seg requires somebody in person to do the cost seg. That makes sense, right? Because when you buy a home, you get an inspection, they're not doing it from Zoom, right? That's basically that's what he's saying. That good for you to not let anyone trick you into that. The cost seg, you get somebody in person to give you a very detailed, thorough, supported, research supported report saying that toilet is not worth a grand. That's pretty nice. It'd be a nice toilet. Okay. I'm going to keep going unless somebody... All right. It's your turn. Uh -oh. All right. Here's a fun one. Real estate professional versus passive investor. Mike was asking about this earlier. I think Brad was too. So... A lot of these fund depreciation benefits, real estate is the way of the future. That is because you are a real estate professional. You get better net operating loss benefits, you get better deductions, you have less limitations on those losses. 
I'm not to say that passive investors don't get benefits. That is not what I'm saying. But for the most part, when you think of real estate, you think of being a real estate professional. Now, there are several layers to being a real estate professional. The thing to keep in mind is, it depends, and you should talk to me or somebody, um, but if you're doing it full-time, you're a real estate professional. How do you prove you're doing it full-time? Well, you've probably got a ton of emails, you've got probably a bank account set up, you've probably got a commission check coming from KW Elite or whoever. Um, you've got mileage records probably, right? Um, those are some softball things to keep in mind. For passive investors, if, if you were a passive investor and you were trying to get losses to offset your W-2 wage, you would likely run into a limitation of $25,000 loss if memory serves. Then maybe 50 if you're married finding a joke. Now that's not a lot if you're making an 80 or 100 plus W-2, right? And you were, you were sold by X, Y, and Z, so hey, come invest in here and you get a huge loss, wipe off your doctor W-2 or something. Um, the benefit where somebody has a huge W-2 and then the other person doesn't would be that other person is a real estate professional. The loss wouldn't be limited. Now, you could probably tell I'm skipping over a lot of shit, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm skipping over a lot of stuff. But the, the thing to keep in mind is passive investors get benefits, but real estate professionals, as most of us see it, are what you're trying to become. You are committed. 750 hours a year, or that, that's the main thing you do in your year. You could still have a W-2, but that's gotta be probably close to part-time, if not less, of your year's income or, or business activity. Um, thank you. So the thing to keep in mind there. Thank you. Given some people are probably moving in that direction, transitioning yeah. full-time, part-time, and doing real stuff, say stuff at the same time, what have you seen in the industry as the likelihood of the IRS auditing when someone is working year one. You know, two jobs at one, the year one? The year one trade. So see, he's asking in the year of change, so I know some of us, I know I've talked to a few of you who have changed this year from a W-2 to full-time real estate. What is the likelihood of truly qualifying for real estate professional and then getting audited and then officially losing? There's kind of three layers to that, right? Um, if you're a real estate professional, it doesn't matter. You're a real estate professional, you should take the benefits and we'll support it. Now the gray area is if you're a real estate professional as of December 31st, 2021, I wouldn't touch that with the info poll probably, unless you had some support from like March and April that you've been building your book and you've been doing a lot of research and you already purchased the property and you're slowly decreasing your responsibilities and your other job. I mean, you could see how you could build, what's it? Facts and circumstances. It depends, facts and circumstances. It's a conversation where we build the facts and circumstances that you qualify probably, hopefully before 1231 of this year, but it still could if it's you know the third quarter or fourth quarter of the year. No, I didn't answer your question totally. Oh, the third part was audit challenge. So if we're building facts and circumstances, if you have records, if you've got mileage logs, if you've got um, you know, your Google Calendar, Hello Calendar shows where you've been meeting, who you've been talking to, that's pretty good support to show that you were doing this for whatever time frame we're talking about. Now, to answer your question more fully, I'd have to go into more technical stuff. I'm not gonna do that, but it, long story short, if you remember nothing else, even as of today or maybe December, if it's still on your mind and you've already quit your job recently, it's worth talking about and looking into. Especially if you're gonna buy a property and get that depreciation to wipe off your current year. <coughs> you do technically have to have more hours in real estate than hours in your other jobs over the year. Agreed. And that's, yeah, yes, that's, that's a huge part of it, not to be undersold. So he's saying you technically have to have worked in real estate more than your other job. So by sheer math, if you're changing in November, maybe good luck, but it depends. Some people work 90 hours a week. I know, I know, I do. Wherever my wife is, she's probably like, yeah, you do. She's always oh, she took a call. Yeah, okay, right on. Yeah, right. So it, it really depends. Seriously. So oh, sorry, hold on here. Sorry. <laughs> do you want me to hold on to that? I can walk around. Appreciate your patience. 
Okay, sorry if this is a dumb question. If you have an S Corp in a different industry, so I W2'd myself the first half of the year, but then now I'm just getting distribution, so are my distributions passive from that S Corp and doesn't count against my hours for my real estate professional status from sure. when I ended my W2 yeah. to like the end of the year? Got, you've got a few questions in there. <laughs> you might not realize it. So a W2 with distributions, distributions, um, yeah, they're not they're not part of W two. Then that doesn't impact your 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 calculation here. Distributions do not affect your calculation here. The fact that you're working affects the calculation. Hope that makes sense. If not, we can. So if I'm passive in that business, other people run it. But you get W two. I stopped my W two. Oh, I see. So you won't probably get one for 2021. Well, I will, but it's. Small. Got it. Got it. So the fact that you get a W two doesn't stop. It doesn't fully stop you from being a real estate professional. Now we're getting tax advice here, so I'm treading carefully. Yeah. I see what you did, there. but <laughs> no, it doesn't. And it's worth conversation, or whoever your provider is, you should talk to them about it to see. You know, I do all this stuff. Yeah, I, I own this business. I'm part of the high level discussions, but I'm not in operations. My operations are in real estate. Help me work through the math on this and, and create a um, criteria and documentation. It'll walk you through the criteria. You got to help provide the documentation. She's asking again for anyone that missed that. If you've got an S score in a totally different field, but you've stepped away from operations, can you still qualify for a real estate professional? You can, but I would definitely talk to somebody to help make sure you got the details down. Good. One second, Mike. It's for, the, for the pilots. And the audit would help me out was they, and the IRS order called me up. They said, Who manages your properties? Who's your manager? Yeah. And I said, I'll manage all myself. Yeah. No, who manages your properties? I do it all myself. So I was able to take account for all those hours back and forth, lease preparations. So that's very useful. It's a big deal. Yeah, so to hammer home his point, um, hiring a property management company is awesome, right? On paper, they do all the work. They're taking care of all the issues. They just issue you a net check of whatever your income is, right? Your net income is. The downside is if that's how you're trying to prove you're a real estate professional, you're going to have to document some other circumstances because a property management company are taking away a lot of the activities that you should be you should be doing your work. Um, well, I don't have to go any farther than that. I think we all get that. But just know that if, if you're trying to use that property for establishing real estate professional and you don't have a lot of other properties, you should reconsider your involvement in the property management piece. When you're, well, before you're audited for sure, but ongoing. Um, somebody else had a question. Does the same apply for an employee, a direct employee underneath your organization? Ask that a different way, please. So you said the property management company would take away your hours to count towards real estate professional. Let's say instead you hired your own in-house W2 employee. Would the same apply? Or do your direct supervision of them still grant you those hours? That's a great question. Um, my answer is high level because, you, again, you're getting technical on me. Uh, you're technically supposed to work more than other people depending on the circumstance. This is a so, long room for that. Yeah, right. Yeah, you guys will work a ton. I know that, yeah. <laughs> um, again, you asked a technical question. I'm trying to give you a kind of a shitty, it depends, technical answer. Uh, yeah, no shit. Or maybe not. I don't know if I want to do it with that. Uh, it, so, it, yeah, it's, thank you. She said, does he, does he have a shoebox? Uh, it, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think I answered your question. You got to keep keep track. Like if they're working three times more than you, and that's the only thing you do, I'd be careful about being a real estate professional. What if you um, own a property under property management, but you work for that property management company? <laughs> so, that was that. So, I was so distracted on that question. If uh, you own a property um, and it's managed by a property management company, but you work for that property management company. <laughs> Are we doing this? <laughs> oh, man. 
Well, you probably do other stuff, right? Yeah. Let's be honest here. That's not the only thing you do. Correct. But I would be the only one probably doing most of the work on it. Yeah, so you probably have your own, you could probably make up your own records to hit the requirements. Again, I'm not going to talk about the detailed requirements, but you probably could. Okay. That's something to keep in mind, though, for those of you that that, that have, what, let's say you work at the desk of your property management company, you don't leave your desk. What are you do there? I'm not going to answer that, but you got to think about that. <laughs> All right, who else? I'm trying to grill me here, the shitty, it depends answers. <laughs> All right, we got one more here. Uh, here, right behind you, it's coming up. Right, hopefully this is not how it depends <laughs> well, I'm not gonna answer that, yeah. Um, but I think a lot of us are active investors, yeah. and um, what would, what, so you mentioned uh, uh, cost segregation, bonus depreciation, yeah. what are some other like paper losses that you recommend that we can maybe fit in for this tax year? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. She's asking what other, Outside of depreciation, are there paper losses that you can find? Yeah, well, I'm going to get to tax credits, which are, well, not losses, but they can help with taxes in the current year. Um, honestly, depreciation is kind of bread and butter. I'm not going to sure code that. We'd have to do some Googling. Uh, but that, that's probably more, well, I'm going to leave it at that. Depreciation is what I'd recommend right now. And beyond that would be more one-on-one -on -one research for your circumstance. So depreciation, cost eggs, and then tax credit, I'm gonna bring up here later. Not it depends, but you're pretty damn close, probably. <laughs> uh, another question here, Ted. Yeah, passive investors still have business expenses such as mileage or uh, Omaha RIA membership as a business yeah. expense. Well done, well done. Shout out RIA, right? Woo! Thank you, Ted, for doing this. Thank you. And, uh, and your sponsorships do count too, right? Know, brother. Uh, yes, but uh, I shouldn't say. So if I say yes, just know that it means generally yes, right? Okay, are we good here? Uh, if, if yes, they would be suspended or, or subject to passive rules. So what the hell does that mean? You you follow the passive category. So think of capital gains, think of stock sales, think of those groupings. Um, it's worth keeping track of. Talk to your advisor on it. Um, they'll probably give you further advice on that. But great question. Um, I am gonna. I, I love these questions. As I, I was not understating, I this is my favorite part of the job. Generally, I have much less people to work with, but. Uh, because I can actually give better advice. That's the kind of exciting part of it. But um, I do want to be respectful of everyone else's time. I, I can stay here. I think my timeline with my kid is like 9.30. Um, but this might be my last question for this section, and I'm going to jump through the next ones. So go ahead. I've actually got an answer, not a question. Oh, so yeah. you can say a question. <laughs> yeah. uh, to answer Leslie's question, paper losses this year, you did mention cost seg. A good way to get a hold of cost seg when you wouldn't normally is a syndication. Oh, so if you right. either have, because of a personal relationship or you're an accredited investor, a lot of times syndications that first year they will do a cost seg, which, you know, not all of us are normally buying million dollar properties, right. but you could buy into a syndication and get cost seg losses that year. That That's a great rent. point. So that is not actually what you were saying, because you were talking about like deductions and stuff, or like, like your investment property, but that, that's a better answer. So what he was saying is, how, how do you get other deductions in the current year beyond the cost seg and depreciation? Well, you can get into a cost seg and depreciation by joining a group of people and investing in a big ass property that does a cost seg. And then your dollar, you might even get a dollar for dollar deduction, honestly, especially if you're a real estate professional. Passive investors may also get that, but at a certain point they're capped. Again, passives are capped at certain points Real estate professionals are not. So if you invested 25 grand into a $3 million property, they do a huge cost seg, get big dedu deductions, you might get your 25 grand in a deduction this year. Where normally it would take years to get your $25 back as a deduction, or 25 grand, sorry. Thank you for finding that, that was a great idea. And that's definitely what you should look into. Especially if you or your spouse are a real estate professional. Okay. Hold your question. Please. Okay. 
Oh, um, big thing here. Factors to consider. So if you're if you've got a, a passive revenue stream already, you might not want to be a, uh, or you might not need to be a real estate professional to get your benefits. Let's say you have um, a big stock payout every year of dividends. Um, you were inherited you know, several million dollars. They pay out dividends yearly of whatever sixty thousand um, dollars. You kind of want to do real estate, but you don't want to do like eighty-hour weeks like some of us do. Um, you could be a great passive investor and wipe out that 60 grand of dividends. You don't have to work eight hours a week. You get all the benefits. There's, you don't lose out on your deductions because you have passive income. Something to consider. NOLs, we kind of talked about this earlier. NOLs were a big topic the last couple of years with the COVID stimulation changes. For the record, all that stimulation and those tax changes, you know who, who went through, who that went through? So remember, it, all those are great benefits. My wife and I, we were doing our best to keep up with them. I was sending emails like, hey, this just changed. Like, oh shit, it just changed again. Oh shit, it just changed again. So I, for those of you I worked with during that time, I'm sorry I wasn't able to keep up with them totally. Bear with me, we're doing our best as a firm to, to learn it on the fly, let alone the Department of Revenue people who are fucking swamped. Uh, yeah, like I, I, I've spent hours on the phone trying to get a hold of them, let alone like they might not be the right person. Or like, yeah, you know, I'm working from home, I don't have all my responsibility, uh, accessibilities. You know, they that job is, what's the right word? Super thankful they work that job. I would not want to work that job. I love this. That is a grind. So thank you for them to do that. Um, and good luck to them for keeping up with all the changes, let alone just the real estate tax ones. There's plenty for just me to learn in this. So shout out to them. All right, and that operating losses were big because for those who had huge depreciation in the current year, you could actually take back losses five years. So let me, let me say that again. Net operating loss means you have so many deductions and depreciation, etc., that it wipes out your W-2 and all the other income. So the current year, on paper, you have a loss. After your W-2, after your other W-2 S-Corp income, you have a loss. You could take that loss back five years and get refunds from 2015, 2014, 2013. I did one that had yeah, what was that? Nebraska and federal. I think I did like 10 amended returns was crazy, but his refunds were like $200,000. Definitely worth doing. It took a lot of time, very complicated, but worth doing. So, if you've got a 2020 net, uh, one second, if you've got a 2020 net operating loss, um, 2020 net operating loss, you have time to still carry that back to 2015, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, whatever it takes to use it all up. Net, depending on the state, also applies. So if you're in Nebraska, and I think in Kansas and uh, Iowa, they all allow this carry back. Now they might have different rules, maybe they only get back two years, but if you got a state loss or a federal loss in 2020, I think you have until the end of the year to carry that back with a shortcut form. Well, that's all I'm gonna say on that, unless you have specific questions, because that also gets technical. So that is worth doing, but don't yell at your banker when they deny your <laughs> loan because you have no income. Oh yeah, so you're showing, you, you all of a sudden show, 2019 shows income, and then all of a sudden it's a loss. That's what you were saying. Yeah, so yeah, okay. show a loss, there's certain things we can add back, right. but there's certain things we can't. Right. Okay, so, so depreciation is good though. So depreciation is a big one. So she's saying if, if you have current year income, but then you invest into a big syndicate, and get a huge loss. So if your 2020 now, or 2021 went from showing income to now showing a loss, that might not help you when you're getting a bank loan, unless it's something they can add back like depreciation. Cost savings depreciation, right? Right on, brother, yeah. right on. Yeah, but I'm just saying as a, as a whole, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's certain things that we can add back. There's also, if you have a huge loss in one year, we can then, we, we basically don't count it. Cool. So we do, and that's why we ask for multiple years of tax returns. So make sure you do have a tax professional doing your returns. Yeah, and on that note too, I've, I've now, um, I work with a handful of people here and also Chris Pomelo and Colin Schwartz. And 
you know, they're getting to a lot of shit. So I've gotten to the point now where I make annual reports of their ABEX for the makers. So I, you know, like, it's not like whatever, 30 properties or partnerships or whatever it is. And I list out the depreciation. And so I, when they ask for it, I just give it right to them. They can send it to their bankers say, look, here's our $2 million of depreciation or whatever it is. Boom. Hopefully all the questions are answered at that point. Oh, here we go. Uh, just like the cost tax study, is there a, an amount of taxes last year or the last couple of years that would make it beneficial to do? Uh, yeah, it might surprise you. I didn't pay 200000 in taxes last year. My numbers, my numbers are way better than that, but my point is, is there a point that it's a waste of time? The same way with the cost tax study. Yeah, you can, so you probably see in the top of your tax return or somewhere in the tax return the rates you paid. If you think your rates in the prior year, the income tax rate you paid was higher in the prior year than it will be in the future year, you probably want to carry it back. It's a good way, a good study for it. And if, if you're, if your income tax rate was like 15, 22, 24%, you might want to consider carrying it back if you're going to be 15, 10, or zero going forward. I don't have many slides left, so I'm trying to rip them for you guys. Passive investors basically know that if you're a passive net operating loss, a passive activity loss, you can't carry that back. That's the way it goes. It's the main thing to remember here. Oh, and 1031 has an impact. I'm not gonna explain that more, because 1031. It's a cute way of saying, defer paying income taxes until the sale of that property. Um, this is a sexy, complicated area. At the end of the day, if you are, let's see, somebody was saying 15 years into a 27 year property, and you want to, you want to get a new property without paying taxes on the sale or like getting out of your current property, 1031. You're deferring the gain you would pay on your current property and pushing that gain into the new property. And it impacts your depreciation. Not, I don't think we need to get into that, but ultimately you defer your current gain into your new property. That's the main thing to remember here. If you want to not pay a current year tax on your, your current property and get into a new property, 1031. The second thing to keep in mind is you want to know this ahead of time that you're going to do it, so reach out to me or whoever your advisor is to say, look, this property is running its course. I'm looking at, to get into a similar, maybe bigger property. How do, what's an option to do that, 1031? You want to do this ahead of time. Retirement account. I get this question a lot, and this is one I definitely hammer home. It depends, big time. So, real uh, retirement accounts from real estate. Can I invest in real estate through my 401k? The quick answer is yes. Now, do you want to? I don't know. But for the most part, I wouldn't recommend it because it gets very complicated. Can have a lot of. There's a head nod back there. It gets very complicated. Um, you have different tax filings that are beyond the scope that we want to talk about right now. It might and probably would recommend if you're really set on and on using that cash, be worth taking out your 401k, paying the 10% Fed, the 3% state taxes, and then investing. Now 10%, 3%, 13%, that's pretty big, but uh, it might be worth it. Uh, here's one and then here's another one. I use segment two key. I had a big pile at about 45 years old. So I used a systematic 72 geek distribution. So I was able to buy at that point, taking out that calculation of about 6% of my pile, about $30,000 a year, cool. to buy an investment property. No restriction on saying, you want to talk about 72 key a little bit? Uh, I'm not going to explain that here, but okay. I, I hear what you're saying. But it's very valuable, especially if you can retain your retirement accounts. Your IRA. Yeah, as a whole. But we can get a systematic distribution over the uh, at least five or seven year period. Yeah. To do a calculation. It's, it's based upon the present uh, 10 year P bill rate. It's awesome. But I was able to just take it. That was income. Yeah. Was income. Yeah. But I was able to take it on penalized age 50 for seven years, $30,000 per year, yeah. without looking my IRA, and that money could be used for any purpose. And the 50, he said age 50 is important because I think it's 59 and a half. If you take out money before that, 
you pay these penalties we're talking about, plus some other niche advising. That's not applicable to most of us. I'm not gonna get into that. But if you want to, that's not tonight, that's a meeting later. Don't see me after for that. <laughs> that's a meeting later. Good thing, Mike. I have several clients that have taken their income producing properties after they got to a certain age and converted them into their Roth IRA. Different that's it's the Roth. Yeah. Is where it makes the benefit. But yeah. you really you want really want to make sure that you're talking to a Roth IRA real estate management company. Yeah. Not just I would blue. Into a Roth. Yeah, and the other thing too is you're going the other way. That there's again I'm not gonna explain that further. That I'm glad you brought that up. That is important. Um Okay. Oh, timing. Timing's big. So if, if we're at the if we're at the end of the year, no, like something. Uh, if we're at the end of the year and you're thinking about making a change, saying, look, Mitch, I just switched my job, I'm I'm committed to real estate. My wife and I are talking. We think we want to pull out our four one K and this will be the week. So actually I think this is what Ted did. I think Ted pulled out his four yeah, yeah, right on. Which is a great idea. If, if you're committing, that's a great way to jump in and fund yourself. Um, now, I, why I say timing, um, and you jump in if you want to say that. I was just, just going to say I did a uh, self-directed 401k for two years into the Dream Investing Capital Fund, and uh, and that I got to a point where I just wanted to get some real estate under my own name, so I cashed out of that, go ahead and paid the fines, figure out make it a profit on profit on my property. And you guys consulted me through that process. So, oh, Andy, he's the man. Uh, Andy's a partner at my firm. He's my mentor. Totally love him. I know he works at home with Jerry, and I work with Jerry too here. Um, wouldn't be here without Jerry, or uh, without oh, Andy. Uh, I wish he could be here. He's got several kids he's got to take care of. So, anyways, it's it's very important. It helps a ton. And um, if you have other net operating losses, by the way, you might only pay the penalties. You might not pay income tax. We can talk about that more later, just throwing that out there. Timing, why is timing important? If this is the first year of your transition and you're thinking about poor quality 401k, next year you know you're gonna have a ton of depreciation and losses, you might wanna switch that 401k withdrawal from December to January because you might not pay income tax on it. You might only pay penalties. Or if you're doing some niche planning stuff, we should talk more. But if, if you're on the bubble, if you're thinking, hey, I'm gonna pull out $100,000 of my 401k, and we're already in November. If you want to maybe buy a property in January instead of December, you might still you still get the bonus because that's that's through 2023, 100% bonus. So you get you still get the same benefits. You don't get to wipe it out against current year income, but you you might pay less tax on that withdrawal. 10% penalty, 3% penalty state, but maybe no income tax depending on. The facts and circumstances. There you go. That's the main oh, okay. I, I'm sure a lot of you guys listen to the Bigger Pockets podcast today. Uh, I don't know if you listen to that or not, but they got a look pretty in depth about the the changes they're trying to make with self directed IRAs. Uh, I don't know all the specifics. I didn't read the law, but they're talking about trying to pull it away, but they're trying to fight it. Do you know any thoughts on that? Which way it might go? and how that could affect this group. I mean, they mentioned something that you, if you're invested in something, that you have two years, you have two years to pull all your money out if this happens. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. And I'm not gonna dwell into this because I don't think this will apply to many people. If I'm wrong, see me after or at a different meeting. But um, it's, it's not uncommon for them to go after stuff like that. Right, um, real estate. There are a lot of benefits. You know, it's a hot topic. Trump doesn't pay any taxes or whatever year, however you swing on that. But um, real estate and some retirement account um, games, um, whatever you want to call them, those are often targets to raise bills. You know, raise the funds. It's, I don't need to explain that further. You probably all know that. As far as the likelihood of it happening or not. Not going to touch that with tempo pool either, but it is something to keep in mind if that affects you specifically. Now, I think you said self directed IRAs. I don't think a lot of us would have that. Could be wrong there. Um, if you do, again, come see me or Andy or our team. Happy to help you. Very niche topic. We'll get that.
But thank you for bringing that out. Then bigger pockets. Well, specifically Ted's podcast. I would start there first. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Right on. All right. This is my last one, guys. Thank you for sticking with me. Uh, 45L. This is one of those changes that's on the horizon. Currently, it's at two grand. Could be five grand. What the hell am I talking about? It is an energy efficient home tax credit for home builders and developers. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a tax credit if you have a certified report saying you are energy efficient, you meet certain thresholds for efficiency, um, and then you file some tax forms, you could get $2,000 of a tax credit per unit. And if this reform goes through, it could be up to five grand per unit. Okay, what is he talking about? Energy tax credit, two grand per dwelling unit, maybe up to five. That's the thing that remind me to keep in mind when you ask myself questions later. <laughs> uh, well, when did this apply? I've never heard this before. What the hell, Mitch? Yeah, right on, totally. Uh, you can claim it after the fact, retroactively. So if you think this might apply to you, come reach out. I know Glenn, his team, raise your hand, Glenn. His team does a qualified energy efficient reports. I do not do that, I do the tax returns. If you've got specific questions, go ahead and ask him. Just say, you, you heard about this through Mitch and Rhea, and he'll help you out, his team will um, explain that aspect of it. We do tax filings, we can help with that. Long story short, we're not gonna dive into this. You guys have already stuck with me for an hour and 45 minutes, thank you. Remember, if you think this will apply home builders, developers, and energy efficient, you want a tax credit, come see us or me, and I'll probably refer you back to him for the, the report piece. Um, student housing, assisted living, general apartment complexes, I mean, it, this is fairly inclusive. So if you think, oh, and as far as the energy efficient piece, I know Glenn and I talked earlier this week, for the most part, uh, people, are already meeting fairly energy efficient standards. Now that's not a guarantee your project qualifies, but it's something to keep in mind that if you're on the bubble, if, if that's the piece we're on the bubble on, you should talk to one of us and we'll, we'll maybe bring you home the rest of the way. Yeah. Is this for new builds or is this for something that you can question? Uh, new builds are already completed. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, so if, if, if your project's already done a couple years ago, I, I think it's up to three years, maybe Glenn would know that. Three, three years. years. Um, you can go back and get these tax credit for these builds. And Based on date of occupancy, not date of build. Thank you, date of occupancy. No, so when somebody, rehab. Uh, Glenn, rehabs? Rehabs can, but it's very difficult because with a rehab, you have to almost have made sure Nobody's been living there um, oh, while wow. the work was done. Sorry, uh, rehabs are very difficult because um, when you're talking about the type of credit here, you're upgrading HVAC, windows, lighting, whatever it may be to qualify for the credit, and you're really not doing that while somebody lives there. So it's not cosmetic painting, new cabinets, new uh, black backsplash and stuff. So it can be but most of the credit is, has been more on new construction. So worth the conversation. If, that, if you think you're on the bubble here, definitely it's worth the conversation with either one of us to see if you qualify, because that's, I mean, that adds up pretty quick, right, Mike? That's intense. Um, oh, yep. Question on capital gains. Is that only at the federal level, or is there state level types of capital gains taxes on different assets? Depends. But seriously, uh, New, Jersey, New, Jersey, New Jersey's got some crazy at-backs and disallowances, not specific to capital gains, but it really does depend on the state we're talking about, so I'm, that's all I'm going to say on that one. Yeah. What else we got? You got a question? Oh, yeah. Oh, right on the front table. Hi, my name's Melanie Reeb. I'm with Breed of Insurance Services. I was just going to chime in and say that this is a big discount on the insurance side of things as well. Right. Is a lot of carriers are asking if there's solar power or panels on the roof and if the home is energy efficient. So it's a way to save on the insurance as well. Great point. So the solar panels bring up the premium or bring down? Because those can be pricey too, right? It, 
Depends. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> well, that's a great point. Yeah, if you're energy efficient, why wouldn't it bring on the premium? I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. So many else got questions. I know. Come on. Yeah, a couple more. I need. Good. Okay, be wrong. Oh, here's another one. My Ted, thank you. Just one of the, one of the 1031 exchanges. What's the general rule of thumb for how long you need to retain a property before you're looking at using taking advantage of that? Oh, I, I've heard one to two years. I don't know. I think two years. I, I just I haven't known what it tends to be as far as like what they're. Expecting. You know, it's kind of a pain to track. So it might even just take one or two years just to like do from start to finish. The first property you get into, you hold it for a year. You get on. You get the right buyers lined up. You give your money to the qualified. <laughs> A third party, it's a complicated circumstance. So I think to answer your question is you can do it, I think technically every year. Um, now in practical sense, it's probably not gonna happen. It probably will be two to three years where you get from A to B with your second property. Um, yeah, so it's not necessarily the intention when you buy that. It's, right. That's that first something about intention. You know, like that you're gonna you're gonna hold it versus flip, you know, what's kind of look more like a flip. Yeah. So Yeah, I suppose actually I suppose in 2023, which I think is the last year of the 100% bonus, well, okay, in 2024 it goes down to 80, so your spread it there isn't very big. So what I was trying to get at is what would be a way for you would want to go into a property, get that current year appreciation, but knowing that that's not your last property, it would it would be probably something with that, but again, that if it's only 20%, it might not be worth the headache. Um, plus, you, remember, you gotta figure out a buyer for your current, you're going into a property and you have to know you're gonna get a buyer and then you gotta find the right property right after. And we're talking short windows. I didn't explain that. Uh, 1031s require a lot of shit. And none of which, or not the least of which is enough buyers and sellers to go in and out of these properties. Um, and in the timeline to move the cash around. Hold on, hold on. Thank you, I've done a lot of these in South Carolina, Massachusetts, and I consulted with various CPAs. And there is case law that I, I, I go down to this very fun. deeply. Very okay. fun. You want to there, is, there is case law, <laughs> and, and, and it's not it's not the actual IRA statute, but there's a lot of case law. Right. This is a two-year minimum hold requirement. Oh, there you go. Okay, a two-year minimum. We're at minimum by force when I talk about this, and also intent is very important. Yeah, intent is important. So oh, they, right. So if, 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 if they if they can see that, for example, I'm selling my 23 family. To buy an oceanfront thing in Nantucket and move in there immediately for two years <laughs> as my primary residence, they'll no, disallow that. So intent is very important. It could be more than two years. It's really disallowed. So intent is vital, and the two-year aspect is vital because my, my accountant says you want to challenge it in, in IRS uh, tax court. No. So at minimum yeah. two years. And related parties too. Like you can't be. Yeah. Yeah, but even after two years, they look at intent. Right. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Think, think we're good, huh, Ted? We got pass, man. <laughs> we got pass. You thought taxes were good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you for that. We want to talk about it. We got to get out of here. We're good. Yeah, we're good for another hour. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, we're good for another hour. Okay, so, so, can I have a drink or something? I will definitely <laughs> have a drink. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate you very much. <laughs>